Welcome to the Moonlit Ghosts Moonlit Tale of the Haunted Natatorium. I poured my heart into this story and I can confidently say that this channel is going to be one of the best mysterious storytelling slash research channels on the internet and you have an opportunity to help me lay the groundwork for it right now. For just $1 a month, you can gain access to daily patron-only content, early access to the Moonlit Minute Shorts, access to a private Discord channel where you can share your stories, and last but not least, your name in the credits of each of the Moonlit Tales, just like the one you're about to watch. Also, as soon as the Moonlit Ghost gets 50 patrons, I will post two Moonlit Tales just like this one every week. And this tale is definitely worth your time because although oftentimes hauntings are accompanied by a heartbreaking story of tormented souls who suffered unfavorable deaths, some of them are a little different. And it's these types of stories that I absolutely love researching and sharing with you guys. So stay tuned and watch all the way to the end, even past the credits to see what I mean. Shoutouts to the Art of the Ages secret message winners here, like and subscribe, and now I present to you the haunting of the gnat. Sweltering heat often had the locals of Amarillo, Texas pining for a cool dip in the river, and savvy entrepreneurs, seeing the need, made their move. The Amarillo Natatorium Company hired architect Guy Carlander to design a state-of-the-art natatorium. But, but wait, hold on, what in the world is a natatorium? Natatorium? It's natatorium, I think, because I, I googled it. Natatorium. It's an old timey word for an indoor swimming pool. The gnat, as it was known then and now, even to this day, opened its doors for the first time to the public in July of 1922, and boy, did people take to it. Located right off of historic Route 66 in Amarillo, Texas, it was an ideal location, and upwards of 6,000 people flocked to the pool in the first week alone. The Nat boasted a state-of-the-art indoor swimming pool, which was one of the cleanest and coolest the South had ever seen. But as popular as it was, unfortunately only four short years later the pool would be no more. In 1926, J.D. Tucker purchased the building and transformed it into a dance palace, undertaking the elaborate and expensive project to renovate and construct a smooth ballroom dance floor over the once extravagant pool hall. He didn't fill the pool in, but rather covered it with 10,000 square feet of maple hardwood, leaving a large, dark, and creepy, hollow underground complex where the pool once flourished. At first, this transformation was met with frustration, especially to the local swimmers, but the flappers of the Roaring Twenties quickly filled in the void and took right to it. Although the pool was gone, the dance floor boomed just like the pool had, and doing its predecessor proud, it boasted one of the nicest dance halls the South had ever seen. All the while, it maintained the name The Nat. On the Dance Palace's opening night, the Nat opened its doors to the public for free, allowing any and all to boogie down the live orchestra music on the fresh, sleek, new dance room floor. That was just to get them hooked, though, because following nights you would be charged a whopping 5 to 45 cents to get in. That wouldn't deter flapper and latest Poltergeist patron supporter Cece from swinging and jittering across the smooth hardwood floors to the hippest live music of the time. The place was truly hopping. <laughs> Big name bands the likes of the Dorsey Brothers, Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, Roy Orbison, and even Buddy Holly were regularly booked at the Nat. And although a lesser known but equally important band named Monty McGee and his orchestra would regularly grace the halls with their big band sound. In fact, Monty McGee and his orchestra were there so often, at some point, their name became synonymous with the Nat. In fact, it was eventually painted in big, bold letters on the side of the Nat, where it remained for years. Despite its uncanny popularity, though, over the years it would continue to have to evolve in attempts to stay relevant especially during the looming and difficult depression years of the late 20s and early 30s, and then 
the ensuing war years of the early 40s. New features and gimmicks came and went. There was a gambling hall introduced to the upper floor at one point. Businessman Harry Badger added a diner, renaming the place the Nat Dine and Dance, and he even added a fortress-like facade to the front of the building, which made it stand out even more, adding indelibly to the Nat's unique and historic value. Local products and other merchandise started being sold there as well. All of these things were attempts to attract new customers, boost revenue, and remain relevant through difficult economic and emotional times. Though difficult times were felt by all, the people of the era and the area of Amarillo sure knew how to have fun, and the Nat proudly hosted many local events which would endure in the hearts and memories of the people for generations. The Nat changed hands once again in the 40s and a certain Dr. William Maddox redesigned its exterior. He left the fortress facade intact, thankfully, but decided that Monty McGee was no longer relevant, so in 1942 he painted over his name. And it just so happens that it's around this time that the contagious atmosphere of the Nat would slowly and unfortunately start to dissipate. The Japanese had attacked Pearl Harbor and the United States had entered the war. World War II was taking its toll on little old Amarillo and the Nats' popularity was waning. Many young men who had grown up frequenting the dance hall would never return and those who did found the Nat to be a place of fading nostalgia, sometimes overwhelmingly so. People were moving away and the contagious spirit, which once fully imbued the Nat, didn't carry over into the rising generation. It was also around this uncertain time that Maddox first started noticing strange things going on with the building. That, on top of certain legal troubles, kept things from flourishing as they once had. Although it's hard to verify that this actually happened, it is said that around a year after Monty McGee and his orchestra was painted over, it mysteriously reappeared, seemingly overnight, on the outside of the building, to Maddox's great astonishment. Thinking someone like an original street artist like Banksy must have been responsible for the artwork, he simply painted over it again. A little time went by and McGee showed up again, seeming to bleed through the exterior paint used to cover it up. The story goes that this happened several times and no one is quite clear as to how or why Monty McGee and his orchestra just wouldn't stay away from the Nat. During the 50s, even more strange things started to happen in fact, even at that time, only 30 years after its original grand opening, the place had gained a reputation as somewhat of a haunt. Which was a little odd because, for one, the building relatively wasn't that old, and two, so far as anyone knew, despite that sometimes painful nostalgia, no one explicitly ever died there on the premises. In fact, the place was, and still is, a generally happy, uplifting place, full of fond memories all the way around. Long-term residents of Amarillo can attest to that fact. At some point, recruits at the nearby Air Force Base started whispering about an incorporeal ballroom couple who was regularly seen gliding across the floors, only to vanish in the blink of an eye. But this story was only hearsay, and perhaps it could have even been a marketing ploy by Maddox to pique the interest of hotshot pilots looking for excuses to hold their girlfriends a little tighter at the net, which was now quickly entering a new and strange phase of its existence, one being slowly imprinted with a lonely and ghostly presence. Eventually and unfortunately, the dance hall, as with the swimming pool, would dwindle and go the way of all the earth. In the 60s, it was abandoned completely. Aside from several attempts to revive the glory days of the Nat, it never quite made a full recovery, and for years, it sat in obscurity, empty and 
dark. It was purchased again in the 90s by the Cavins, but this time it wasn't to be a pool, a diner, a gambling hall, or a dance palace, but rather it was made into an antique shopping mall where it continues to be such to this day. And yours truly, along with the Moonlit VIP crew, had the pleasure of visiting this truly historic, unique, and iconic building. For the entire uncut footage, visit The Moonlit Ghost on my Patreon and let me know if you see anything strange in what I captured at the historic Nat. And historic it truly is. In 1994, it made it onto the National Registry of Historic Places. A year later, Texas made it a historical landmark. During the process of transforming it into an antique shopping mall, though, a lingering, inescapable oddness couldn't help but be felt. The new owners started noticing odd things here and there. On the upper floor, which, if you remember, was where the gambling hall once was, there were uncanny and inexplicable cold spots where it seemed as though in vague, brief moments you could see your own breath. This was, to say the least, a little bizarre for the heat-stricken panhandle of Amarillo, Texas, and it only happened on the upper floor. Cold spots would only be the beginning of the new owner's worries. Furniture and other items would mysteriously move around in the middle of the night. Loud banging noises and even music could be heard inside the building after hours when no one was supposed to be there. In fact, an account from a certain Janet, as reported by Backpackerverse, tells of a terrifying encounter that happened at the grand opening of the antique mall. Janet, a longtime local, excited to see the place open, was there when it opened its doors as a shopping mall. She began exploring the interior and fond memories rushed through her mind. That is, until she saw the stairs leading to the upper floor. At this point, she reported a feeling of near possession. Something was urging her to go upstairs where the lights of the business were turned off. It almost felt like, she said, that something outside of my body was compelling me to go up to the second floor. I went up one stair at a time, she continued, and all the while it felt like somebody was whispering, yes, yes, in my brain. Walking around a corner, I suddenly saw this pale woman in the middle of the room. Janet screamed. The upper lights quickly turned on as a manager rushed to Janet's side. And to her surprise and embarrassment, standing right there in front of them, she saw a white female mannequin. Perhaps the most astonishing story comes by way of employee complaints. A woman in a 30s style white gown, which had a red stain on the front of the dress, regularly walked through the new shopping mall. But strangely, no one ever saw her enter the building or exit. It was almost as if she lived there. So enough was enough for the owners. In 1996, they invested in a full-on paranormal investigation of the premises, and what ensued was a lot of ghost hunting cliches. Camera equipment that was supposedly fully operational would inexplicably stop working. Claims of being poked or slightly touched or shoved occurred frequently, and grainy, barely audible EVPs were recorded but there was one EVP that stood out. It caught a woman singing with drums 
playing in the background. A local psychic was also called in to aid in attempting to understand what was actually going on at the Nat. The psychic made contact with the woman in the white dress with a red stain on it. It turns out, according to the psychic, that this woman regularly frequented the dance palace and gambling hall on the upper floor, and it was there that she had become the victim of an unfortunate incident that occurred during the height of the Nats' dine and dance days that ultimately went unreported. While the woman was having a good time dancing to the live orchestra music, which potentially could have been that of Monty McGee, she swung around and collided with another patron who had been drinking. His glass of red wine spilled down the front of her dress. Embarrassed, he quickly begged her forgiveness and tried to help clean up the mess. But even more astonishingly, she quickly laughed it off, grabbed his hands, and continued dancing throughout the night without any further hesitation. This woman that we don't know the name of wouldn't let a little thing like spilled wine interrupt her fond, her precious, and her beautiful time at the Nat. And that's where her story ends. <laughs> as far as we know, despite its many ups and downs, nothing bad ever happened at the Nat. Her apparition just happens to stick around which is what a lot of people when they were alive did at the Nat. They stayed there late into the nights because there was simply no better place to be. People felt like the Nat was their home, more so than their actual homes, and they loved it. So what is actually going on here? Uh, is it possible that positive emotions can be responsible for creating ghosts just as much as negative emotions can? Is it possible that these people maybe went off to war and died a horrible death, but didn't stay where they died, but returned to the Nat? Wouldn't you think that if this place was so uplifting, that you would be free to move on from it if you desired? What is keeping these spirits at the Nat? Maybe they just really like being there and are very protective of it in the case of Monty McGee. That is, if we can be certain that these things are spirits at all, and not just the over-imagination of the residents and employees. Either way, is it possible that there is actually a dark side to the Nat that remains unknown to history? A little-known fact about Amarillo is that there is a network of strange tunnels crisscrossing below the city, and it is surprisingly difficult to find out much information about why they are there, how long they've been there, and what they were ever really used for in the first place. So let me know what you think in the comments below. But. Before you click away, just look at this graph. My last Moonlit Tale about Silkhenge, which had an awesome watch time, but tanks right about here. So I am unabashedly trying to keep your attention. Is it working? Because I'm not done with the video yet. First of all, I wanna know what you think about the net. Is it haunted? And if so, why? What are the tunnels all about? And if you want to see all of the video I took while I was there, hit me up on Patreon where it's there, open to the public to watch. And if you have any stories about Amarillo or the Nat, please comment down below. I've heard the whole town is haunted. I'd love to hear your stories. And if you have a longer story to share, feel free to email me at themoonlitghost at gmail.com or head on over to the Moonlit Ghost Discord where you can share stories there with a the community of like-minded individuals, of both skeptics, believers alike. And who knows, I might even share one of your stories during one of my live streams that I do every Friday night. And guys, if you want your name right here next to these amazing people, feel free to go support me and become a creepy shadow over on my Patreon for just $1 a month. 
and that also gets you a lot of other friggin' cool things. Feel free to peruse all of the perks and choose which one fits you best. Also, get your name shown at the beginning of next week's Moonlit Tale by commenting today's secret message, and that is 50 Moonlit Patrons. Remember, if I get 50 patrons in any tier, I'll post two tales just like this one every week. And finally, here is a sneak peek of next week's amazing story. Four years later, at seven, she saw it again, and this time she was with her older sister, Barbara, who also witnessed the event. These strange sightings were actually surprisingly common in the area, and Elizabeth wasn't the only one to regularly see them. The tribespeople, the Zulu, would often report on these UFOs, but they didn't call them UFOs. They called them lightning birds.